From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Miss Streeter at Dr. Shepard's office. Yes? Dr. Shepard gave me your hotel number. He said you were to come in for a head x-ray. Let me talk to the doctor about that. Well, he's out on house calls right now, Mr. Dollar. He'll be back late this afternoon. He seemed very concerned over... He ought to be. A friend of his banged me on the head with a gun this morning. That's why the x-ray. Well, could you possibly come in and have it made? Doctor was most insistent... All right, Miss Streeter, I'll be right over. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Expense account item four, one dollar, cab fare, from my hotel to Richard Porter's office. Porter was sympathetic. You know, I feel very responsible for this, Mr. Dollar. I hired you to look into all oh, this. Oh, it'll go I... away, it'll go away. I've been hit on the head before. Hey, do you have anything to drink in here? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you never can tell when a snake will come up and bite you. <laughs> yeah, here you are. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I suppose you came in to give me your expense sheet now that it's all settled. Not exactly, Mr. Porter. It isn't settled for me. Well, certainly you know I'll assume any medical expenses involved here. That no, I'm not talking in. about that, Mr. Porter. Sit down. <clears throat> now, look, there's something going on here, and we might as well have it out. You hired me to investigate a client who wanted to buy $80,000 worth of straight life insurance, right? Yes. Now, that client explained why he called for that insurance. Not to my satisfaction, but he explained it. He said a man named Paul Forbes had threatened his life. Threatened it because Dr. Shepard had advised Forbes' wife to get a divorce. I know you didn't believe this, but the facts now seem to bear it I out. went over to see Forbes this morning to talk to him about his threats. I managed to get my name out, and Forbes attacked me, so I got this. Then Forbes ran out. Mrs. Forbes and a servant in the house gave me first aid. All the time they were doing it, they were apologizing for Forbes and his violence. Finally, Dr. Shepard came in, called the police, and told them to pick up Forbes. And the police will pick him up if they haven't already, and Dr. Shepard will prefer charges... And that, that won't be that, Mr. Porter. Not as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Shepard's story is still leaky. I'm sorry, but I think it has more credence than ever in view of what's happened. You told me yourself his wife and the servant admitted Forbes had threatened Dr. Shepard's life. Oh, I believe that part. But Shepard lies so much, you can get to believing him. What lies, for heaven's sake? Oh, for one thing, his reason for not calling the police right away. I mean, about how delicate Mrs. Forbes' condition was. She looked pretty healthy to me this morning. Another thing, he described Forbes as a man with homicidal tendencies. Now, Dr. Shepard's supposed to be an expert on behavior. And he thought that if I talked to Forbes, I might settle the matter peaceably. But Forbes attacked me as soon as I told him my name. I didn't get a chance to talk. Well, Dr. Shepard has no control he over... He felt Forbes. pretty sure I could talk to Forbes. If you don't like that, let me go on. What reason did Forbes have to hit me? He didn't know me from a load of coal. Somebody put him up to it. Who? Oh, who do you think? Shepard, for some reason? Shepard was the only one who knew I was going right over there. But why? I don't know. What would he gain? Uh, my business for an x-ray. Uh, yeah, you're joking now. I suppose I am, but I got a headache. I feel off. Oh, uh, here. Uh, how about... Mrs. Forbes. Oh, here. Thanks. Oh, she seemed like a genuine enough person. Not sick the way I expected her to be. Someone slugged her recently. There was a bruise under one eye. Uh, Shepard said her husband was an erratic, ruthless, violent man. Well, look, I'm stubborn, Mr. Porter. I still think Shepard's been lying to me. If for no other reason, then I think I know the breed. Well, what's all this got to do with the insurance application? Well, that's another thing I don't know. Expense account item five, three dollars, cab fare. Dr. Shepard's one-story building to have my head x-rayed. Shepard was still out, but Miss Streeter did the honors. Almost in silence. Outside of sit still and hold it, nothing much was said. Well, the picture's okay, Mr. Dollar. I looked at it. I didn't see anything wrong. Of course, the doctor will call you when he's had a chance to see it. Swamp. You must have got quite a blow. That's a nasty bruise you have. Oh, it's pretty good, all right. He swung his gun hard. Well, the doctor will be back about mid-afternoon. He can call you at your hotel? Yes. Well, thank you for coming in. I want to ask you a question, Miss Streeter. Yes? Are you in love with him? What? Are you in love with Dr. Shepard? What? 
That's rather my own business, isn't it? Unless, of course, in your investigation of whatever you're investigating, for some reason I'm under your scrutiny. Well, I suppose it is, and I suppose I can take that to say yes. I'd become rather angry with you, Mr. Dollar, but frankly, you seem rather ridiculous. I suppose so. He's a liar, isn't he? I mean, Shepard. One more question. I told you on the phone a friend of Dr. Shepard's did this to my head. Now, did you ever ask me who that friend was? Oh, I think you'd be curious about a thing like that, Miss Streeter. I think I have a great deal of work to do, Mr. Dollar. Expense account item six, another three bucks, some more cab fare. This time, back to my hotel, where I picked up my rented car, filled it with gasoline, item seven, $5.30, and drove out to Pawtucket. At the home of Mrs. Clara Shepard, I explained my name and business to an elderly man who answered the door. He asked me to wait a moment, then returned and said Mrs. Shepard would see me. She was a bright-looking, gray-haired woman in her mid-sixties, elegantly groomed and obviously well cared for. We went through the politenesses, then got down to business. My son applied for $80,000 worth of life insurance and named me beneficiary. That's about it. (laughs) I wonder what he's up to. So do we. You mean, so do I. You don't trust anyone, do you, Mr. Dollar? He said his life had been threatened. He told me he wanted to make certain you were well taken care of in case anything happened to him. Uh He was lying, wasn't he? I haven't seen him, talked to him, even had a Christmas card from him in three years. Maybe he does worry about his poor old mother now and then. I'm flattered. What you're saying about him isn't very flattering. Oh, I don't think Charles ever thought much of me as a mother. Still doesn't, I'm sorry to admit. But then I don't think too much of him as a son. So there we are. Is it too early for a cocktail, Mr. Dollar? How do you explain him already having a $20,000 policy on himself and wanting to kick it up to a hundred? You the beneficiary. No explanation. That's why I suggested a cocktail. To my friends here... Charles is a successful doctor in Providence who calls me faithfully every day, sends me gifts, and is always assured that I am well and happy and occupied in my old age. I guess I like you, Mr. Dollar, perhaps because, with all your gruffness, you might be nice to your mother. No, Charles and I aren't close. Never have been. I can tell you this. I don't need his closeness, at least not in a financial way. If Charles were to die and I received $100,000, it would mean a rather difficult tax problem. If he were to die, part of me would die too. I'd like you to have just one martini with me, and then you may go. Mr. Dollar. I had the one martini with the tall, stately woman who struggled against tears. It was an old struggle with her, increasingly difficult, I guess, as the years kept on. We talked no more of her son or the insurance or the threat on his life. I left there about four o'clock in the afternoon. I drove back over to Providence and got to Dr. Shepard's office about a quarter to six. A broad-shouldered man in a tweed suit was in the reception room. He got to his feet when I walked in. Dr. Shepard? No. Don't I know you? Yeah, I was thinking the same. Wait a minute. Yeah, your name is uh, Dollar, your insurance investigator. Yeah, uh, you're <laughs> Phil, Phil Crosby, yeah. Providence Police. <laughs> well, I met oh, you in New Hartford yeah. once. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you were down here. Hey, you must be the one. This Dr. Shepard called downtown about a threat in his life and said an insurance investigator had been slugged trying to help him out of it. Yeah, that's right. Well, where is he? I don't know. I rang that buzzer there. There's no one around at all. What's this all about? Well, a man named Paul Forbes threatened the doctor's life. He slugged me. You got a pickup out on him yet? No, not yet. Trying to pin the doctor down all day long. Been out on house calls, emergencies, everything else. We have to get his signature on a complaint. Mm, I thought that was all taken care of by now. Uh, Well, hello. Hello. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Miss Streeter. This is Phil Crosby from the police department. Police? I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, miss. Is anything the matter? Just want to see him. Oh, goodness, he was here ten minutes ago. He sent me over to the pharmacy to pick up these things. Oh. What? 
We had an emergency. 1213 Putnam Street. Got a note from him? Yes. Massey, please. But no name on this, Miss Streeter. You recognize the address at all? Oh, no, I don't. Doctor wouldn't take a random emergency unless it were very unusual. This might be unusual, Phil. This is down by the water. How bad off do you think Forbes is? Mad, had a gun, plenty rough. I rode down on the police car with Phil Crosby. I had a feeling about the acuteness of that emergency. As a matter of fact, I had a feeling about the acuteness of everything that had happened that day from the time a half-crazed man had slugged me with a gun. The feeling was heavier than ever when we hit the neighborhood. Come on. All right. Wait. How oh, what? 1213 Putnam Street. That'd have to be that vacant lot over there. This is 1240 here. The rest belongs to the warehouse. Yeah. Phil. Huh? That car empty on the plates. Yeah. Yeah, that's Dr. Shepard's car. Motor's still warm. Must be around here somewhere looking for the address. That's a dead end there. I better call in for some help. Fog's coming in if he's wandering around here. Yeah. Phil Crosby went off to find a telephone and request help. I stood by Dr. Shepard's car, waiting and listening and smoking. Nothing happened. No one cried out. No guns went off. Then Crosby drove up in the police car. Come on, report's in. A report was in, all right. We drove two blocks down the street where a small, curious crowd of people had already gathered in the cheerless fog. A uniformed man from the Harbor Division was standing over what appeared to be a bundle of clothes lying in a heap. We bent over it, and Phil looked up at me with a question mark. That Shepard, Johnny? Yeah, that's him. Yep, I'd say he's been dead less than half an hour. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a liar is still lying, even though he's dead. Join us, won't you, and I'll tell you all about it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.